Um, quadratic equations, quadratic functions, if you will. Um, these are second degree uh, polynomials that make up the equations, make up the functions. And then comes the question, what does that mean? Got very quiet. What does that mean, second degree terms? What does it mean? Okay. Uh, yeah, do you know? What does it mean? Well, I need to know what it is. What is it? Okay, this guy's been, he remembers stuff. So, let's go back for a second. He says it has a square in it. Does it necessarily have to have a square? Uh, let me ask you this question. Is this, the thing I'm about to write,
these sets. So I'm going to actually start at the bottom. Uh, the natural numbers. Cool. So uh, natural numbers, I can pick on somebody. I shall pick on, no, oh, that's too easy. Uh, uh, too easy. Start counting for me, please, Anthony. Very good. Okay, you stop. Natural numbers, that's when you naturally count. You start with one, right? Usually, usually only one, two, three. These are natural numbers. You can write these as fractions, right? You just put them over one, whatever. So they're rational. Now, these are a subset of the whole numbers. At some point, uh, we realize that we need a zero. Uh, the Romans did not know they needed zero. Roman numbers don't have zero. But eventually, they said, you know, zero is a good thing. I don't have any more. Zero, right? So that's a whole number. And then we have integers. Uh, at some point, you're like, hey, you owe me money. You owe me. So there's negatives plus all the whole numbers, right? Integers. And these, these are all subsets of rational numbers. So when I say that you have to, I'm going back up here. There was a reason for this. We're going back up to, um, I need a whole number exponent. I'm going to rewrite this because we can. Isn't this? Let's see, let's see, I'm going to get rid of this x here. Minus x to the minus 1. Are these equivalent? Remember negative exponents? A little bit? I one person think went to it. Yes, I remember that. Nobody else. Nobody else. Yes. What, what's a negative exponent? Does it make this negative? It's just saying, if you're writing this in a numerator, it's really something in a denominator positive. If you put it in the denominator with a negative, it's really in a numerator positive. So um, this one, is this a polynomial? Is this a whole number? Well, now that I know what a whole number is, I can see it isn't. It doesn't follow the definition of polynomial, therefore no. Basically, you can't have variables in a denominator, and it will be a polynomial. This is a polynomial, this is not. So you can't just say fraction. What if it's, is this a polynomial? One half x, y plus z. Is that a polynomial? Yes, if you look at the variables, does it have whole number exponents? What's the exponent on that x? A one, one is a whole number. So that's how you can tell. So now that's the first thing you have to know. Is it a polynomial? We're still getting back to degree, right? So how do I figure out the degree? Well, each one of these terms is called a monomial, and it has a degree. Hint, this one has a degree of 7. So how do you find the degree? Nathaniel? It is the highest exponent. Well, it is the ex What it is, is it's how many variables are being multiplied. That's how you find the degree of one term, one monomial. How, what's the degree of this monomial? Four. Careful now. Well, how many variables are being multiplied? Three. How many variables are being multiplied? One, two, three, four. Oh, four of them. So you find the degree of each monomial. To find the degree of the whole polynomial, the biggest one wins. This is a seventh degree polynomial. Don't have these, right? Seventh degree polynomial. So now this was all to get back to what I think about second degree equation. So Brian was right and he said, well, there's an x squared in it. Well, there is an x squared in it, but there can't be an x cubed in it, too. Or it could be an xy. That's still second degree. We are specifically mostly talking about, in this little uh, discussion today, this kind of a polynomial, which is our quadratic parabola. But anything, like, any second degree equations, I don't know, we should be anything. But when we talk about second degree equations, those are quadratics. All that for one bullet. Boy, it's going to take a long time, isn't it? Yes. All right. Uh, I'm going to get rid of this, but look how much you learned. You learned so much today. So it just, just like that. And it will all be with you. Okay, so this is actually quadratics. There is a lot of real world applications. Physicists out there love their quadratics and then other kinds of polynomials. Uh, for example, um, if you look at here the Golden Gate Bridge, suspension bridge, this is a very quadratic shape of the cables that hang there. Um, area is quadratic, second degree, because you'll multiply like a length times a width, an x times a y. That's second degree. You're multiplying two variables. Uh, trajectory, cannon fire. Uh, that is quadratic. Right there is that beautiful curve. Falling objects, that path is quadratic. Uh, orbital objects, that's quadratic. And most important of all, yeah, you know, each of these arches in the McDonald's sign, quadratic. No. Oh, yay, quadratics. No. Well, actually, this is blue quadratics, you know, quadratic, you know, McDonald's, not something for you. Don't 
I didn't say that out loud. Okay. So quadratic equations, quadratic functions, come from something called conic section. You take two ice cream cones and you touch them at the point. And a section, all that means is cut them. So you take like we call take a slice through here. And you see the shape that's formed? Here's our friend the parabola. Right? We did this last year, you'll do more with it next year. This slice here, we did that this year. It's a circle. We learned a lot about circles this year. If you slice a little bit to the side, that circle becomes an ellipse, which is more like a you know, squishy circle, uh, an oval. And then this thing here, if you kind of cut and you hit two of them, that's called a hyperbola. You'll learn more about these guys in, uh, I guess, pre-calculus is when we do that. Uh, the other thing, too, you've seen this before. Does this look familiar? Remember, I'm throwing in review wherever I can. What? Remember what that is? What is it? I don't know. I, yeah, I remember seeing it. Inverse variation. Inverse variation. You remember what that thing looks like, which I'm thinking maybe it's It's like this. It's a parap it's a hyperbola rather. That's this kind of shape. So again, you, this is for you to look forward to in a couple of years. Uh, this one next year. Uh, and we did the one this year. So let's concentrate on this guy. Conic section. What happened here? Okay. Um, so this is getting down to stuff. We kind of reviewed it last time, so we don't have to spend a ton of time. But just kind of reviewing. Here's our parabola. It is a symmetric shape. There's your line of symmetry or the axis of symmetry. There is a vertex. Remember that? Remember another word for vertex? Do we have another word for that? No. Yeah. Now, I want any, it's not on this one, anything. Any type of a parabola, what's another name for the vertex? We don't remember. Okay, well, we'll get to it. So anyway, standard form of these things, and I should put a y here, of a function, y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Standard form looks like that. This is a parent function. Parent functions are actually really important. We kind of skimmed by this last year. Next class especially, we're going to see the importance of the parent function. Y equals x squared. That's this one. Uh, the vertex is the lowest or highest point of a parabola. This is what I was trying to get you to say. Turning point. Yes? Go down, 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 turning. Going up, 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 up. That's your vertex. There's another name for this one. You know that yet? No? We don't remember? Oh, OK. Well, we don't know. Axis of symmetry, line of symmetry, you get two symmetric pieces. These are reflections of each other. You know all those words now? All right, concavity. And I am talking about uh, the standard form here, so let me put that back in here so I can see it. Definitely did this last time. Concavity. Concave up is the smile, right? And then concave down is that frown. Okay, it occurs when A, and I'm talking about this A, that leading coefficient is positive, you are concave up, and when that A is negative, it will be concave down, right? Sure. You will have a minimum. There's the other word I was looking for. Another name for the vertex for a concave up parabola is minimum, and another name for it, uh, for the, the down one, concave down, is a maximum. Uh, let's see. So graphing calculator, we're just going to look at the, the function here. If you've got your graphing calculator, fantastic. Um, I think I will speak to what I want to do here, but I'm going to, uh, so x squared, if you forgot how to put this, you see your alpha key right next to it, that's the x button. Right? If you forgot where it is, it's been a while. So here is the parent function x squared, y equals x squared. Yep, right? Yep. Now over here I've got y equals negative x squared. I want to graph that one as well. So I'm just going to put it right under it. Make sure you use this little negative button and not the minus sign. X is up here next to the alpha key, x squared. So when I push graph, the first thing you'll see will be the x squared and then negative x squared. And oh, here's negative x squared. So using the, the new words we learned, you know, when we kind of reviewed, when we did our transformations unit, what can we say about these two curves? What can we say about them? Ms. Brian. All right, so we did talk about that. Yes? Reflection. It's a reflection over the x-axis. All I did was change it to a negative. 
So transformations occur when we kind of mess with these. So negative does that. Quick question, yes. Does the work happen yet? Um, okay, so what else? So there are other transformations that can take place, dilations. So uh, if you have, and again, I'm working with f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Talking about this a. Now what does this little, what do these lines mean? Absolute value. So what is, what is this trying to say? <coughs> the absolute value of a is bigger than one. What is it? What? What's it trying to say? What? Do we get what that means? Yeah, what's that mean? Okay, so if whatever A is, make it positive, and if that number is bigger than 1, we call that the magnitude of A. It means disregard the sign in front. Just worry about A. So if it's negative 2A, blah, 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 just worry about the 2. So if that number is bigger than 1, what happens? The parabola gets narrower, we call that a stretch. And if this case happens, now what does this mean? Absolute value of A less than one. Well, but what is, I just, what, I have to understand what this little inequality means first. What does that mean? Like what's an example A here? Like what, half. Another way to say this is A is between negative one and one. Remember, I'm sticking as much review as I can here. Can we remember this kind of notation? It says a bigger than negative one, a, and at the same time, it is less than one, a is between but does not include negative one and one. If that's the case, you have a number like a half, one fourth, two thirds, right? What happens? It gets wider. We call that, or among other things, a compression. So this one, uh, if you start with your um, parabola, a stretch is you kind of hold the vertex and then you pull on those strings. It gets a little bit tighter. Compression is you kind of smash down on it. It's going to get a little bit wider. So we're just going to look at a couple of examples on the calculator. Uh, I'm going to keep my x squared so I always see what my parent function looks like. And then I'm going to graph 4x squared. So the first thing you'll see is x squared and then 4x squared. So here's my x squared. Now my 4x squared is going right in between. So by now or I mean a stretch. It's like somebody pulled on these and pulled it tighter. So that's what happens when you have a number or whose magnitude is bigger than one. Now I'm going to put in the one quarter just to see what that looks like. When you're typing in a fraction, don't turn it into a decimal. Just put it in parentheses and type it in like that. Let the calculator take care of any of that conversion. So we've got x squared, then we've got 4x squared. The last one you see graphing will be that one fourth x squared. Here it comes. We have that wider look. So that's what I mean by that. So in the middle, parent function, here's my stretch, here's my compression. So the number in front means something. What would happen if I put a negative here? What would happen if the negative goes here? What's it going to do? It's going to make that reflection across the x-axis. So this is what I mean by transformation. We're going to be working a lot with transformation. Next class. Okay. Let's review the graphic. We're still having trouble with this, aren't we? Yes. All right? So we want to graph this thing. Great. Two ways to do this by hand. One way is to make a table of values. What's that? We should have done this in algebra one. Maybe even three algebra a little bit. Right? You make an xy table, and then you choose x's from the domain. Oh, yeah. What's a domain? What is that? What is it? X values. X values. The set of inputs. What are we allowed to use as inputs? If it does not say, we're going to assume we mean the all real numbers. Anything you want. <laughs> so I'm going to just choose some. You choose a subset of your domain. These are nice ones to start with. You never know what's going to happen, right? And then you say, how do you get the y's? Yes, sir? So, um, that in. in. Take f of 0, f of what, right? So if I plug f of 0 in, I'm choosing that one first because it's easy. Because when you plug 0 in, anything with an x kind of goes away. So I'm left with 8. And then I would graph it in this one, so it would be off my graph. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it's up here someplace, right? Uh, that, what about 1? That's kind of easy, too. 1 minus 6, negative 5, negative 5 plus 8, 3. So I'm going to see 1 is 1, 2, 3. Then you try 2. 2 squared minus 
Uh, 6 times 2 is 12, so that's 4 minus 12, negative 8, plus 8, is that 0? Yes, it is. Right, and same with values, so just keep doing this until you kind of have a connected dot and you can see what's happening. That would be um, table of values. This is actually a really good method. Don't put a discount it. You can grab anything pretty much, anything with one variable, using these table of values. Sometimes the other method doesn't work and you just want to get a few other points. So just make a little table of values for a couple of other points. But for the most part, we want to concentrate on how can we use properties of parabolas to help us get the shape. All right. Now we could also use the graphing calculator. Of course we can, right? Um, why are we bothering with all this if we can just do, you know, that? Why bother? With what, using the graphing calculator? Three eight, you say Y1, right? Y1 equals? You type that in, you press a button, bang. Graphed, right? It's not a lot of steps. So why are we bothering to torture you with this other than, you know, that's what we can do. Like, why do we bother? Well, let me ask you this. Uh, oh, yeah, we can, yes, why? Yeah, so, you know, kind of, it's very hard sometimes to transcribe it. That's the reason. Why else? Maybe that's how you can't have a calculator. Yeah, you know, or, you know, you're walking down the street, right, minding your own business, and there's like a quadratic emergency and somebody needs to crack, and you don't have a calculator on you, right? You don't know how to do it. That's another reason. Well, how about this? When you were in, what, second or third grade, did anybody make you learn multiplication tables? Oh, oh yes. Oh, why did they bother? You can, why did they just give me the calculator? So that you know what you do. So you know what you mean so you know what you do. Because if you want to turn it to a calculator, you know, like four times eight, you don't know that it's actually eight times nine is four. Because you have no idea what you're doing. Yeah, you say four times eight. Yeah, yeah. yes, ma'am. Much faster, right? Four times eight, bang, right? You know what that is. Uh, these are all excellent reasons, right? Do you ever type something in a calculator? And maybe you don't even know what the answer is. 557 times 14. You know, maybe most of us can't do that in our head. And out comes like 15 billion 972. Like, don't you know that's wrong? That, oh, I must have made a mistake, right? It's called number sense, right? You got a number sense. You need to have a function sense too. And I like that example of, you know, when you were, you know, when you get to free algebra and algebra, you gotta be able to do those simple skills. When you get to calculus, this is a simple skill. You don't know how to do it. Because there's more stuff you have to worry about. So it is good, it's like having a number sense, gives you kind of a function sense. So we're building that. So yeah, absolutely, your graphing calculator isn't thrown away. Certainly verify what you're doing with it. But knowing this, you will need a sharper student. So it's why we're, we're taking that time now. There is a reason. There's a reason to the madness. All right, this is the bottom of the page. Here we go. We're going to review how to do this. So first thing, A equals what? A x squared plus B x plus Z. What's A? Was, yep. Okay, B equals? And C equals? Perfect. What's the concavity? Up, oh, because this number is positive, I know I've got a smile. All right, y intercept, and I've got this notation, f of zero, which means what? What does that mean? Well, what does that mean? Plug in zero for x. x is zero. Zero minus zero is zero plus eight. Yeah, right? That's always your y intercept. What? Yes, in this form, it will always be c. And I like how you qualify it that way. In standard form, it's always c. One, two, three, four, five, I'm on kind of off the pages up here. Uh, X is a symmetry. That's that X equals negative B on the 2A business. All right, X equals negative negative 6 over 2 times 1, 3. So that I have to graph X equals 3. I make a guideline here. My line is symmetry. So it will be reflecting around this. We you know more about symmetry now. Look at the vertex. Wow. What does that mean? What does that mean, Emma? Right, this C calculation is your X value. And then what does F of this mean? Take F of that number. Well, we just reviewed what that means. It's basically make X equal 3, 23. 9 minus 18, negative 9, negative 9 plus 8, negative 1. 1, 2, 3, 1. 
Okay, and I forgot to mention, here we have our axis of symmetry. As soon as I, I put that in here, see my whole point's a little hard to see up here because I'm off the graph, but it's symmetric or reflection. So I can put a matching point on the other side. A question. Will what be true of them forever? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, now we want to figure out the number of, of, of I want to say zeros, right, of this function. Look at it. How many? Two. Now what's the algebraic way? Can we do algebraic way of figuring that out? This is called the... What's that called? Look at the paper. It's right on there. Discriminant. Discriminant. It is that thing in the quadratic formula under the radical. Negative b plus or minus, right? This thing over 2a, right? So this can tell you how many uh, real uh, solutions there are to the equation or how many real zeros there are. So how does it do that? Well, first let's figure out what b squared minus 4ac is for this. What's b squared? 36 minus 4 times 1 times a, which is 36 minus 32, which is 4. So if I were to put this in the um, quadratic formula, that's a positive number, right? 3 plus some number, 3 minus some number. How many solutions? There will be two real, and I should be saying zeros because I'm graphing here. I'm looking for the zeros. Great. Well, what if I did this, and when I, I figured out the discriminant, I got zero, and now there was a zero under here. What's the square root of zero? Zero. zero. So matting is subtracting zero. How many solutions? How many zeros? Just the one. And what would happen if when I figure out b squared minus 4ac, I get something less than zero? Now there's a negative under the radical. In the real number system, can I take the square root of a negative number? No. no. So I say, no, no, no real no. solutions. Now, um, why do I keep using this little qualifier here, this little um, adjective, I guess that is, real? Why do I keep saying that? Aren't, aren't there no zeros? One zero, two zero. Why do I keep throwing in this word? Uh, well, uh, right, we just talked about real numbers crazy, right? This thing, that thing, rational, irrational. Well, the real numbers are a subset of something called complex numbers. And under the complex numbers, we have, yeah, we do, imaginary numbers. And uh, under the imaginary numbers, I actually have two imaginary zero. Ah, so again, this is coming next year. More stuff for you next year. Yay. Yay next year. So I answered this one, two. There are two uh, zeros to this function. Yes, sir. What are the zeros? Now we have, we've discussed three different ways. Uh, let's see, I think I have that on the next page. Um, factoring, right? Zeros are found when f of x equals zero. All right, so I gotta take this thing and set it equal to zero and see if I can factor it. I think I can, because are there two numbers that multiply to eight but add up to uh, negative six? Yes, negative four and negative two, so what's x? Right, two and four. So I know what they are. They are two and four. And then I say, okay, two, three, four. Here we go. Right. Sad thing is, uh, you can't always factor everything. Sometimes things aren't factorable. If they're, you know, you go with two numbers multiplied to this number, add to that number, and there aren't two numbers, we need another way of doing it. There's a space on your bottom, uh, bottom of the page there. So put this under where it says factoring, right? That's the factoring way of doing things. Let's look at the uh, quadratic formula way of finding the zeros of this function or the roots to the equation. x squared minus 6x plus 8 equals 0. So negative b plus, oh, so x equals negative b. What's b? Negative 6. So 6 is negative for negative 6. Plus or minus square root of, can we figure this out right? b squared minus 4ac is 4, right? I think we worked that out. Over 2a over 2, which is 6 plus or minus square root of 4 is 2 over 2. I can actually reduce this. I, I guess you don't have to, but you know, I, can do it. I have to. I can't help it. 3 plus or minus 1, which I know what that is. 3 minus 1 is 2. 3 plus 1 is 4. Right? Same thing we got before. Quadratic formula. You can use it. 
The other way that we learned is about completing the square. So we did review this last time. We're just going to kind of go through the steps again. What? Um, it's easy to complete the square if there's a 1 here, and this is an even number. But what you do is you move that 8 to the other side. Um, it says divide through by A. If this wasn't a 1, you would have to divide everything through. If that were the 2 here, you have to divide. Okay, so we don't have to do that here. So complete the square on the right. What's happening is 6 and square it, plus 9. Always going to be a plus when you square a number. I added 9 to the left, better add it to the right. Put it in binomial square form, that means factor this. But well, because we completed the square, it will always be the same number that's going to multiply to this number and add to that number, right? Negative 3. So I have two of those. Negative 8 plus 9 is 1. Take the square root of both sides, remembering that I need the plus and minus root. Square root of anything squared is that number. Plus the square root of 1. Plus or minus 1, right? Add the 3 to both sides. And this is just what we got with the quadratic formula, right? 3 minus 1 is 2, 3 plus 1 is 4. So just different ways to get the same value. So look at that. And that was the review. Oh, no, that was... Okay, so that's what you needed to remember from last year. The problem that most people have, and I keep getting the same question, how do you get the axis of symmetry? How do you get the vertex? What is that get? Right? It seems to be a lot of a lot of trouble with that. So yay, yay, yay. Another way to find the vertex of a parabola, you don't have to use the x equals negative u over two eight thing. You don't have to plug it in to find the y value. Yay! We're gonna use vertex form. So notice this bit here. We know what this is. It's our print standard form. And then we've got this new form, which is called the vertex form of a parabola. And y equals 8 times x minus h squared plus k. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Is this familiar to anybody? It does look like the circle. And you remember the circle one? It did. This has a k. Yeah, it does. Uh, this, remember how this is a conic section? So is this? So when you work with conic sections, you see a lot of this hk stuff popping up. Um, you could almost think of this as like point slope form of a line. Remember y equals mx plus b? y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. This is kind of uh, analogous to it, a little bit like that. So this form, very helpful. Because if I'm in this form, what's the vertex? h comma k. Just right in that form, right there. Now the only thing you have to do is be careful of uh, this thing is subtracting and this thing is adding. So I'm going to give you an example of a quadratic equation in vertex form, and you tell me what the vertex is. Okay, compare it to this. And I want h comma k. What's h? And what's k? So you have to be careful of. It's kind of the opposite of this one, but it's the same as this one. Let's try a different one. y equals 3 times x plus 4 squared minus 2. What's the vertex? Negative 4, opposite of this, same one as this. Because this is a minus h, so I must have subtracted a negative 4, and this is plus k, so I guess I added that negative 2. Let me ask you another question. If I know the vertex, what's the axis of symmetry for this first one? x equals 3. Because it's all right, isn't it always on that same line? What's the axis of symmetry here? So if you are in this form, it's, it's trivial to find the vertex and the axis of symmetry. So all you have to do is know how to get to this form. No problem. Let's put it in vertex form. So we've been working with it, right? Luckily, we know how to, whoops, come on, come on, come on. We know how to complete the square. So, okay, you're watching carefully. Yeah? All right, I'm rewriting it just so I can see what I'm doing. Okay, now we're going to rewrite this again. All I'm doing is I'm leaving a little space and I'm putting my plus A here. Didn't do anything, but I kind of moved over my plus A. 
write this one. You might want to write this down someplace. Yeah. Okay. We have to complete the square just on this part. So minus six, right? What's half of that? Minus three? Square that? Plus nine. All right, now ordinarily, what we did before, when you added nine, you added nine here, right? And I suppose you can still do that, but I want everything on, I want y equal by itself. If you add nine, what's the opposite of adding nine? And what's nine minus nine? Zero. So if I put a minus nine here, isn't this equivalent to the top? It is. So why am I doing that? Because now what can I do? This becomes x minus 3 squared. I'm taking this perfect square, turning it into its binomial square, uh, plus 8 minus 9, that's minus 1. And look, look what I am. I'm in this form. x minus h squared plus k. What's the vertex? x minus h plus k. What's the vertex? Oh, isn't that what we got before? And uh, what's the axis of symmetry? x equals 3. So this method gives us another way to kind of easily get to these values. You get used to this, believe me. All right, now there is, um, just gonna do a few examples, because that one went awfully quickly. So um, if you look up here, the first one is y equals x squared plus 8x plus 26. So let's kind of remind ourselves of the steps. So you're re rewriting it, but I'm leaving a space. Okay? Because I am going to have to complete the square here. So nothing changed, just a little space. Once you have that little space, you complete the square. Half it, square it. Half of eight, square it. So I added 16. Now I've changed my, you know, it's not equivalent anymore. So if you add 16, what else do I need to do? Subtract 16, so I have an equivalent statement. But I have a lovely uh, binomial square here. That's x plus 4 squared. And what is 26 minus 16? 10. What is the vertex of this parabola? Negative 4, 10. Take the opposite, keep it the same. What's the axis of symmetry? x equals negative 4. That's that line. Take those real easy pieces. Let's try this one over here. y equals x squared plus 4x minus 4. So you rewrite x squared plus 4x. Now I'm going to put my minus 4 over here. That's an x. I'm going to have that. Half it, square it. Well, half of 4 is 2, square it. That's another 4. You just added 4. Keep it on the same side here. I need to subtract 4 again because that's this one. Write this 4 minus 4 to go away. Then I'm going to write this as its binomial square. That's x plus 2 squared. Minus 4 minus 4. That's minus 8. I am now in my vertex form. What's the vertex? Negative 2, negative 8. What's the axis of symmetry? That's right. Okay? So relatively easy when there's a 1 in front. Sometimes there isn't. So watch carefully what happens if there isn't a 1 in front. My leading coefficient. You are going to factor out the leading coefficient, but only of the first two terms here. So y equals, the 2 gets factored out, of these, but the plus 10 is still going to hang out here. So if I take a 2 out of here, I get an x squared minus a 4x. And I didn't give myself enough room, so I'm going to just uh, a bit bigger. Because I need some space next to that 4x. I am going to be completing that square again. So x squared minus 4x, because that's 2x squared minus 8x, right? Complete the square. Whoa. Negative 4. Divide by 2 is negative 2. Square it, what do you get? Plus 4. So I did I add 4 to this side? No. What did I add? See, hi, I'm right here. What did I just add? 2 times 4. I added 8. So I need to subtract 8. Yes, yes, yes. This is a distribution process here. I added 8 when I put a 4 here. So I better subtract it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this becomes uh, x minus 2 squared plus 2. Did you kind of follow what happened there? No. No. We're going to be doing it again. But what is the vertex? 2, 2, axis of symmetry, 
x equals 2. I'm going to try it again with this guy. It's a little more complicated because it's negative. So y equals. You're going to factor out whatever that leading coefficient is, the negative 3. But you're only going to factor it out of these two guys right here. The minus 8 kind of sits over here. Factor out the negative 3 with this one, you're left with x squared. Now be careful. When you factor out a negative 3 out of negative 12, sign changes, doesn't it? Yep. And it's 4x. Yeah? Go backwards, right? They're equal. Package, square it. F of 4 is 2, square it. I, am, I add 4 to my inside. Well, wait a second. Did I add 4 to the equation? What's here? And negative 3. What's negative 3 times 4? I actually subtracted 12. I need to do the opposite to make this equivalent. This is a minus 12. I need to put a plus 12 to do the opposite. And now I can kind of uh, collect a little bit here. Put it in simplified form. That's x plus 2 squared. Minus 8 plus 12 is plus 4. All right. What is the uh, vertex? And what's the axis of symmetry? That's equal to 82. Let's try now with just the negative up front. It, it, this gets confusing, but it's just like this one. Pretend it was a negative 1. So, well, I'm waiting. It doesn't. The negative 3 will do something else. We're going to learn what this negative 3 does, and it's plus 4 to our next class. Can't tell you all the sequence yet. All right. So we're going to factor out the negative. Good question. Uh, x squared plus 6x, right? Plus what? Nothing. There's nothing here. Okay. Nothing here. We'll leave the square. Have the square it. Now, did I just add 9? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What did I really do? Minus 9. What's the opposite? Plus 9. This really is doing the opposite. So y equals negative x plus 3 squared plus 9. What is my uh, vertex? Negative 3, 9. What is the axis of symmetry? Oh. Okay. Let's do another one with the negative just to kind of see it. Y equals, all right, so you take this negative out of only the first two things, and then the minus 2 is just hanging out here. So what happens here is x squared, took out a negative, it's flipping the sign. Now I can complete the square. Half of 2 is 1, 1 squared is 1, so I write a plus 1 here. But did I add 1? It's over here. It's a negative 1. What's the opposite of negative 1? Plus 1. So y equals negative uh, x plus 1 squared, just turning this into its binomial square. Minus 2 plus 1 is what? Minus 1. So what is my vertex? Negative 1, negative 1, and this one. So x equals negative 1 is the axis of symmetry. Oh boy. Anybody follow that? Sort of? I kind of followed it. Well, you know, some of you didn't. Okay. She's like, what? You're kidding me? Uh, why do you do this? This goes back to your notes now. The bottom half of page two is not in bad shape. Yeah, the bottom half of page two is okay. So the whole, well, mostly Show okay. Up. Mostly. Not quite 100%, but okay. So what? what? This was all so that you don't have to do x equals negative b over 2a, and then figure out the vertex by plugging that back in. So uh, it didn't show up on the chart, but there is a place here it says vertex form on your paper. Yeah. So what you want to do is put this thing in vertex form. Well, let's do that. So let's see, the 3 gets factored out, right? x squared plus 4x, leave a space plus 8. So I factored out 3 out of just these two. Complete the square, half the square, that's a plus 4. But is it really a plus 4? Uh, I'll go back over here. 3 times 4, that's a plus 12. Yep, yep, yep. This is true. X plus 2 squared minus 4. That is vertex 4. Well, if you do this a few hundred times, you'll be fine. One, two hundred times, you'll be great. Okay, so what is, uh, what is the vertex? Look at this. Okay. And what's the axis of symmetry? Now, the rest of this is exactly the same. Is this going to be concave up or down? Oh, right, that's positive. Y-intercept, you're going to plug in a zero. 
number of zeros, well, you know, you got to figure this stuff out, find the zeros, just like we did before. Uh, I will tell you this, there are two zeros, you're going to have to use quadratic formula on this guy. Um, but you, you graph the rest of it the same way. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to kind of lead this a little bit because I want you to get some practice time in. But the, if we definitely have different ways of getting here. Yes, ma'am. Well, So um, you can get a lot of the information another way. All righty? Okay. Now, I, think, I think I got it. I think I got it. 